You boys be quiet down there! Welcome to PC 98 Paradise, the series where we'll talk about classic Japanese games for the NEC PC 98, and also discuss how they're related to other classic games that you may be familiar with. So this is my first video covering a PC 98 game rather than PC 88. But not only is this the start to a new series, but also a follow up to my previous video on the first Burai for PC 88. I felt that game was an ambitious RPG for its time, featuring an epic story with tons of cutscenes and characters designed by Shingo Araki and Michi Himeno, famous for their work on Saint Seiya and countless other anime series. As I mentioned at the end of that video, the second Burai game from the following year was never released on PC 88, so today I'll be playing it on the PC 98, which was the primary platform it was developed for. And as much as I'd love to start this new series by showing you the best of what the PC-98 has to offer, instead we'll be starting with a terrible PC-98 game. While I had plenty of positive things to say about the first Burai, the sequel is a totally different story. I mean, seriously, what happened here? My best guess is that the first game didn't sell as well as they'd hoped, so the second didn't get as much of a budget. From what I gather, it seems to be almost universally reviled by those who played it. And I can see why. But at the same time, I think I kind of love it. So buckle up folks, I have a feeling this is going to be one hell of a video. So first off, the proper title of this game is Burai Gekkan Kanketsuhen, which means Burai Part 2, The Conclusion. This is the title for all the PC versions of this game. Once again, the Gekkan part means that it's the second, or lore, volume of a two-part series. There's also one console remake of this game for PC Engine, called Burai 2. The plot is identical, but whatever you do, don't confuse Burai Gekkan Kanketsuhen with Burai 2. Burai 2 is a very good game that tells the same story. I'll talk more about it near the end of the video, but for now just keep in mind that almost everything negative I say about the PC-98 game doesn't apply to Burai 2. Well, let's dig right into this PC-98 game. We've got quite a nice outer casing here, with an epic illustration of the eight main characters. Inside, a previous owner has stuck the original outer seal for the case here. This seems to be the generally agreed upon location to stick these, doesn't it? Next, my registration card looks like it's been torn in two along the perforated edge. Then we have a pamphlet showing other games available from Riverhill Soft, like Seed of Dragon for MSX Turbo R, Sokoban for Game Gear, and several games in the JB Herald series for various PCs. Then there's a sticker. Hey, that's pretty cool. Next is a large map of the world of Burai and the various islands, as well as a list of all items, equipment, and abilities in the game on the other side. This is an invaluable resource, and I'll show you why later. You can see this one looks like it's gotten a lot of use. Next, the Manual of Burai, which is a pretty simple black and white, or black and green, guide to how to play the game. If you open the manual from the opposite side, it becomes the World of Burai, which is a black and pink guide to the story and characters. Lastly, the floppy disks themselves. The game is stored on four floppy disks, and some of you may be thinking that doesn't sound like very many. After all, in the first video I showed that the PC-88 version of the first game had nine disks. This is because the disk format that was being used on PC-98 at this time had a higher capacity. So while these two disks may look the same, the PC-98 disk actually holds a lot more data. For reference, the PC-98 version of the first Burai was also only four disks. To watch the opening, we insert disc 4 in drive 1. Uh-oh, this obviously isn't going to work. I've owned PC-98s with 5-inch drives in the past, but this particular one has only 3.5-inch. Time for some 3.5-inch backups! Did you know that on PC-98, 5-inch and 3.5-inch floppies are both the same format and capacity? This makes it usually pretty easy to make exact copies of 5-inch games to 3.5-inch, or vice versa. PC-98 games from around this time were available as either 5-inch or 3.5-inch versions, and I have games in both formats. I'm generally happy to own whichever I can find. Alright, so let's try this again. Booting Disc 4 should give us the opening. One thing about this opening is that the parts with animation and camera panning seem to run a little too fast on this PC-98, which is actually a PC-9821, one of the later gen PC-98s. 
so the CPU is much faster than what this game was originally intended for. Luckily this model has a handy speed switch. Running it on CPU mode middle seems to give a result closer to what the developers probably intended, so I've decided to run the whole game at this speed. The game is perfectly playable at the higher setting though, only the cutscenes and text scrolling speed are affected. The next thing I want to say about this opening is I don't really care for the visual style of the cutscenes in this game, especially the shading. It has a very hand-drawn, almost digitized look to it. Maybe this looked cool when the game was new, but it looks terrible to me now. I much prefer the more traditional pixel art style of the first game. As for the story, the game takes place one month after the first soft of Burai. By the way, this whole video is going to be a spoiler for the first Burai, which is pretty much unavoidable. But I will give a warning before I show the ending of this game, since it's pretty heavy. The opening shows Hayate's father, who is the god of thunder, in the world of the gods in heaven. He learns of the death of Hayate's mother in the first game and decides to go down to the human world in order to find his son. The second part of the opening shows our villain Bido and his henchmen plotting their next move after their defeat in the first game. They still haven't given up on making Bido a god, so their next move will be to attempt to kill Sakyo, one of the main characters from the first game. Since Sakyo is a god, killing him will create a vacancy and open the portal to heaven known as Burai. Additionally, some of the villains are seeking vengeance against the other jewel warriors from the first game, and Bito says they may do as they wish. Clocking in at only 7.5 minutes, it's a far cry from the 37 minute opening of the original, but that's probably a good thing. When it's over, we're asked to replace disc 4 with disc 1 and press reset. Since the user disc in this game is just a copy of disc 1, and I'm already using a copy, I don't really need to make a user disc. However, as in the first game, it's pretty easy to save yourself into permanent trouble, so it's always good to have a few extra user discs. The third option on the menu says create user disc, but what it actually does is make an exact copy, including your current data. Also, like the first game, you have to be careful to remember that the in-game save menu doesn't save which scenarios you've completed, but this can also be taken advantage of, as I'll show later. To start a new game in this one, you select the second option, Initialize Data, and then select Continue. Again, we get multiple scenarios that can be completed in any order and played in tandem if you choose. And whereas the first had seven, this game has only five scenarios, but they're generally longer and each of them stars two characters instead of one. At the top, we have Alec and Kook's scenario. Select it and we're asked to add disc three in the second drive. This one starts off with a sort of tutorial where you play as Kook, facing off against a dummy of Alec. When you win, you're asked if you want to go again, and the weird thing is that even if you say no, you still have to complete it three times. The tutorial is short and doesn't really teach you how to play the game. I had to learn the battle system by trial and error, and by reading the manual. The battle system in this game is weird. Really weird. I'm not even sure I can explain it, but I'll give it a try. The battles alternate between player turn and enemy turn. Whether the player or enemy goes first is random. In each turn you can choose to play one and only one character. Each character has three slots, one regular weapon, one special technique, and one item. Each of these that is currently usable will begin in white text, which means that it's toggled on. You go down and toggle off each of the ones you don't want to use this turn and then select execute at the top. You'll then see the character carry out each of the moves that were toggled on. It may seem weird that an item is always toggled on by default, but this actually kind of makes sense since items are essential to keeping your party going through most of the game. The game also doesn't have traditional HP or MP. Instead, as the manual explains it, it has two types of HP called spiritual strength and physical strength, and if both get reduced to one, that character will get taken out of battle. If this happens to all characters, then as in the first Burai, you will get kicked out of battle, and if you don't heal at least one character before the next encounter, it's game over. I really can't keep track of which attacks and abilities use spiritual strength and which use physical. I feel like it's sufficient to know that almost any action will cause a character to lose some of either or both. Character gets hit, they lose some of their stuff. They attack, they lose some of their stuff. They sneeze, they lose some of their stuff. The really weird thing about this battle system is that if you want, you can just keep using the same character over and over again every turn without using the others at all. The drawbacks then are that of course the character you use is going to keep losing a lot of their stuff, 
And also, the characters you don't use won't obtain experience. At first I really didn't understand this battle system, but once I got used to it, I actually found it really fun and unique. The game has game-breaking balance issues for sure, but once you learn it, you get the sort of satisfaction you can only get from learning to play an old and mostly broken game, like when finishing a level for the first time in E.T. for Atari 2600. So let's get back to Kook and Alec. They're now living peacefully in Alec's village. Alec is torn on whether he should tell Kook that he isn't his real grandfather, but doesn't want to break his little heart, so keeps it a secret for now. He wants to raise Kook into one of the greatest wizards of all time, so he is researching how to learn a spell which can send a living person to the world of the dead. In the first game, Kook's real grandfather used this spell on Alec for a short segment where Alec literally went to hell and back. But I don't want to learn that spell, Grandpa. It sounds scary. What's the problem? It's just a spell to damn someone to hell. There's nothing scary about that. So Alec and Kook set off to the library in the nearby town to research the spell, along with three fortune tellers who appeared in the first game. Many areas of this game have these weird alternate types of battles in addition to the regular monster battles. In this section, for instance, you will sometimes randomly encounter humans instead of monsters, and you'll be able to tell immediately due to the different BGM. Here, rather than fighting them, you need to use fortune-telling weapons and abilities on the humans until they are satisfied and go away. Later in the game, Kook also has animal rescue battles, Gonza and Mai Mai have street performances, and Romal has fencing. The issue I have with these alternate battle types is that you need to have different weapons and abilities equipped before you get into battle in order to take care of them. And since in most areas it's random, you don't know whether you should have your characters equipped for regular battles or the alternate ones. You have to make compromises, like having some of your characters equipped for fortune telling instead of fighting. On the other hand, there's no penalty at all for just skipping all of these by running away. That's another weird quirk about this game's battle system in general. Whereas most RPGs will penalize you pretty heavily when you unsuccessfully try to run from battle, this game has a 100% escape success rate, making it pretty easy to just skip all the battles you want. The only small danger is that sometimes the enemy turn comes first and then you end up taking a hit before you can run. So Alec and Kook get to the library, and you have this terrible book puzzle to deal with. Fifteen different colored books scattered about the shelves need to be read in a particular order. Each book has a hint, like, I come before orange but after turquoise, etc. I really can't be bothered to figure out the correct order for fifteen books, and the process of bringing each book over to the counter and waiting for Alec to read it is mind-numbing. This just isn't fun. Time to take advantage of the excellent Japanese walkthrough that I used a few times during the game. This graphic clearly shows the solution. Alec finds out from the books that the Hell Spell is guarded by three wise men who live on another island, so they set off to find them. As in the first game, Alec's magic is way overpowered. Stand back everyone, I'll handle this. But then again, every scenario in this one has one character who totally dominates. Kook, on the other hand, has a healing spell that is utterly ridiculous. Keep in mind that these two meters are not only your HP, but also act as your MP too, and watch what happens to the party's meters when you use Kook's healing magic over and over again. In this house we obey the laws of thermodynamics! So as long as you have Kook in your party, and he's reached a certain level, you can heal for free any time, in or out of battle. I'm not so sure the game developers really thought this through. At one point on this island, they need to build a raft to proceed forward, and you get this stupid raft minigame. I could not for the life of me figure out how to control the raft with either the controller or the keyboard. You'd think this would just use left and right to steer the raft as it coasts downstream, but no. After losing over and over again, I somehow figured out that you need to press diagonally down left and down right rather than just left and right. Well that's stupid. Why would I press down? The raft is already coasting down the river at high speed. This really needs some on-screen instructions before the minigame begins. Or better yet, just make it use left and right. After that, we end up in this confusing mountain maze. Mercifully, this and many other maze sections of the game don't have enemies, but the slow speed at which your character walks really starts to become an issue. And the carefree BGM became a little grating as I tried to find my way.
So anyway, they find the three wise men, and they each teach Kook their part of the hell spell. The final wise man, however, asks to speak to Kook alone, and he tells Kook that Alec isn't his real grandfather, and that Alec killed his real grandfather, who had come to him to learn the hell spell several months earlier. He also says that in order to learn the spell, Kook must destroy what he loves most in the world, which in his case is his beloved grandfather Alec. Kook doesn't believe this, any of it. He's even more sure than ever that he doesn't want to learn the Hell spell, but they learn where they need to go next, and Alec continues to press Kook forward. After they leave, it's revealed to the player that the wise man was really one of Bido's henchmen, named Haja, who was sort of Alec's rival in the first game. At the end of each scenario, we get a short cutscene. While the first game had cutscenes peppered frequently throughout, this one only has the opening, ending, and an epilogue at the end of each scenario. That's it. Quite a letdown, but instead we do get these talking faces to accompany much of the dialogue, which are quite expressive and do bring the dialogue a bit more to life. The next scenario on the list is Gonza and Mai Mai. They're a bit down on their luck since the end of the first game and need work. Why don't they just go kill some moss? Ah, whatever. Mai Mai finds some job listings in a wastebasket, and they go on a job hunt around the main continent of the first game, which somehow feels a lot smaller. As you visit all the towns, of course you will also find plenty of equipment shops. The first Barai had a suitability score for each piece of equipment with each character, and the shopkeep would let you know this before you buy. The second game, on the other hand, has a needlessly complicated horoscope system instead. Each character has a horoscope sign, and you want to use equipment that has the same sign, or at least has a sign that's nearby on the chart. You'll also need either the inserts included with the game or a walkthrough in order to see the stats for each piece of equipment, since it doesn't appear anywhere in the game. Even after you equip something, you can't see anywhere how much the equipment is actually improving the character. Even in the status menu, all your stats remain the same. So yeah, overall I hate the equipment system in this game. One improvement over the first game though is now in the towns you can just pay a single low fee to heal your entire party to 100%. The actions system from the first game is also back, and slightly improved. This is the system that allows you to select a stat for each character to practice as the party walks around, and here they've added a meter that clearly shows the current progress. Gonza and Mai Mai eventually learn that the circus is in town. There they meet four furry friends from the same tribe as them, who suggest that they all form a band of street performers. From this point on, when you walk on the roads you will randomly encounter street performance battles, and you'll need to have street performance abilities equipped in order to please the spectators. After each battle, the spectators give clues to where they can find Zoltoba, one of Bido's henchmen, who killed Gonza and Mai Mai's parents. Getting the 30th clue will allow you to enter the forest dungeon. This forest and tree fortress within is one of the longest and most difficult dungeons in the game. I found the four new Ewoks to be hopelessly weak and not really worth trying to improve, so I just let them die. Like I said earlier, in this game you can just keep using the same character to attack every turn, and I found it made the most sense to just use all the healing items to keep Gonza going, rather than wasting them on the other characters. That's how I struggled my way through this and some of the other dungeons. At the end, they find Zoltoba, but when they try to fight him, suddenly a strange portal opens and sucks Gonza and Mai Mai in. The text explains that it would be much later when Gonza and Mai Mai learn that they have been transported 6,000 years back in time, to when the first battle between the gods of light and darkness resulted in the god of darkness being sealed away. And on that cliffhanger, we move on to the next scenario, Sakyo and Ninetale. Ninetale is a character from the first game I didn't talk about in my first video. She's an immortal creature based on the nine-tailed fox of Japanese legend. One of Ninetale's pups is kidnapped by one of Bido's henchmen named Barbara, and taken to the floating palace on the mainland. This is another one of the more difficult dungeons in the game. The worst issue with this one is that you need to collect 14 colored stones, which act as keys, and even after you find the doors they unlock, they remain in your inventory leaving hardly any room for healing potions. What the hell? When they confront Barbara at the end of the dungeon, Sakyo ends up agreeing to teach Barbara magic in exchange for Ninetale's pup. But to do so, Sakyo needs to have his divine powers fully restored since they were sealed away in the first game. Barbara agrees to allow Ninetale to travel to the heavens to bring back one of the gods who can unlock Sakyo's powers. 
Sakyo agrees to remain there in a prison of flames, though he remarks he could easily get out if he wanted to. I realize you can easily break out of here, super friends, so I'm relying on your personal integrity not to. Next is Hayate and Lillian's scenario. They're currently living on Hayate's pirate island. Lillian is still searching for her childhood fiancé and still thinks that Hayate is the one who killed her father, so she's been hiding her true identity from everyone. Hayate, meanwhile, is searching for Lillian, since it was her father's dying wish that he find her. Our high seas pirate adventure begins when seven pirate ships have gone missing, and our heroes set off to find them. Hayate and Lillian are joined by Musashi and Plasma, two pirates who escaped prison with Hayate in the first game. You'll need to navigate a ship across the world in order to find the seven X's on the map, indicating the last known locations of the ships. And while in the ship, you'll still be subject to random enemy attacks. When you board each missing ship, you'll go through the same repetitive pattern. One of the dead crew has a key to the navigation room, and there you'll fight the same boss. While navigating the ship can be pretty hard, especially since you can't see your current location on the map, I didn't have much trouble with the battles. Before every boss in this game, you get your meters fully restored, and Hayate has a technique which can take down these bosses in one hit, which is generally what you want in this game, by the way. Any enemy or boss that takes more than one hit to defeat generally spells trouble. Yeah, it's a weird battle system, what can I say? After defeating the boss on each ship and returning home to the island, they find it decimated by monsters with only one lone survivor, who gives them a mysterious map with one more location to find in the ship. There they get sucked up into the clouds, and Lillian and Hayate realize this is probably the work of Simon, the bad guy who had Hayate's mother under his control in a fortress in the clouds in the first game. They find Simon's fortress, but the party gets separated when Hayate and Plasma fall through a trapdoor. Finally having a chance to talk to Lillian alone, Musashi confronts her. Being the most clever of the group, he has a hunch about her true identity. He gets her to admit that she is indeed Lillian daughter of Jack Lancelot, their pirate comrade who died in the first game. Musashi assures Lillian that Hayate didn't kill Jack. He was there when he died. Lillian promises that she will tell Hayate the truth next chance she gets. You then have to go through this dungeon twice, once as Lillian and Musashi and once as Hayate and Plasma. At the end they all get massacred by Simon, but then Hayate's father finally arrives. He quickly destroys Simon for good, and then introduces himself to his son, letting him know for the first time that he is of divine blood, and that he belongs with him in the heavens. When Hayate refuses to go with him, his father quickly surmises that it is because he is in love with this human woman on the ground with the green hair. After all, Hayate's dad has a history with human women as well. He assures Hayate that once he learns the truth about what the humans did 6,000 years ago, that he will beg to go back to the heavens with him. He sends both Hayate and Lillian back in time 6,000 years. When Lillian regains consciousness, she tries to tell Hayate the truth about who she is, but instead they get in an argument and she ends up not telling him. The last scenario is Ramal and Virgil, by far the shortest scenario of the game. Romal is the lizard guy from a rich family who I hardly talked about in my first video, and Virgil was a minor character I skipped over completely. He's from sort of a tribe of shadow people who protect the secrets of this world. Romal receives a letter from his cousin who has recently opened a bar on another island. Hmm, travel hundreds of miles to visit a bar? Sounds like something I would do. After the journey, Romal returns to find his mansion in flames. I wandered the courtyard here for a long time before figuring out you need to walk between these two rocks for some reason in order to trigger the next event. The mansion was torched by Guthro, one of Beto's henchmen. When asked why he did it, he says only that he has come to show Romal the true history of the world, and then somehow sends Romal and Virgil 6,000 years back in time. They awaken to find the two women who were with Guthro before the time slip laying on the ground. However, these two don't remember anything from the moments before because they didn't come through the time slip just now. They're actually past versions of the same two characters. And that's the end of the last selectable scenario. Next we get sort of a short intermission where Alec and Kook go through the same dungeon Sakyo and Ninetale did earlier in order to learn the Hell spell. Alec and Kook are pretty much unstoppable by this point, and there's hardly any challenge to this game from here on. 
They find Sakyo being held by Barbara and make quick work of Barbara's little pets. Hayate's father then wanders in and sets Sakyo free. He tells them that he sent Hayate and Lillian into the past, which Sakyo finds pretty concerning, so he asks him to send them into the past too. So now we finally have all the original Duel Warriors 6,000 years in the past to gradually join together for what really should be the main segment of the game. It feels like the developers didn't have the time to make this part what they really wanted it to be. The entire map has only two mostly deserted towns, only one real dungeon, and two mountains which serve as sort of the entrance and exit to this section of the game. We start on one of these as Alec, Kook, and Sakyo. First they happen to run into young versions of the three wise men who guard the hell spell. Apparently they were over 6,000 years old. They save them from an animal attack, but unfortunately they say they haven't learned the hell spell yet, so they part ways. Next they find Gonza and Mai Mai, who are starving again, and have by now figured out that they are in the past. Mai Mai tells them a rumor about a suspicious group of characters currently hiding in the pyramid dungeon from the first game, which is currently under construction. There they find Romal, who is now followed everywhere by the two women who will later become Guthrow's henchmen. Romal is disillusioned after seeing his mansion burn down and his whole family probably killed. He's seen the war between light and dark in this time and wonders if what the Jewel Warriors did in the first game had any meaning at all. Hey, that's actually a really good question. Romal decides not to join the party, and we have to move on without him. So Sakyo's had a bright idea since traveling back to the past. Why not intervene in the conflict between the gods of light and dark and try to prevent the god of darkness from ever being sealed away in the first place? Hell, if that's the proper way things ought to be, then why have none of the gods ever decided to travel back in time and change the past until now? Seems like kind of a plot hole to me. So they travel to Mount Lagante where the final showdown between the gods is about to begin. On the way up the mountain, they find Hayate and Lillian, who had the same idea about changing the past. So now's the last chance to turn back before I talk about the end of the game. While I usually expect everyone to just ignore my spoiler warnings and watch the whole video, I gotta say that the ending to this game is pretty heavy, and kind of demeaning to the point that I'm afraid some might not even want to play the first game anymore after seeing it. So just so you know, you have been warned. When they reach the top of the mountain, Ninetale and another god from the present appear to unlock Sakyo's full power. Sakyo then instantly destroys the army of light and dark and tells both of the gods to return to the heavens, and with that, the past has been changed. Neither god was sealed away, and both are still alive in the present, meaning that the first game never happened. This is canon. Come with me if you want to live! Sakyo then takes them all back to their own time, but on the way there, they are intercepted by Bido, who transports them to an alternate dimension where he has been hiding until now. Sakyo informs Bido that the past has been changed, and that as a consequence, Bido's father, the god of light, never had a son, so Bido was never born. In fact, the instant he steps outside this alternate dimension, he will cease to exist. Bido doesn't believe him and calls it nonsense. He tells them to come to the top floor of his castle in the alternate dimension if they want to go home. And so begins the anticlimactic end to the Burai series, with an easy dungeon and bosses, and a raving lunatic for a villain who doesn't even know he's already lost. There isn't really much of a threat. Next, Romal walks in from the top of the screen and apologizes for not joining earlier. How the hell did he get here? This really could have used some explanation. The final dungeon has no enemies, just some small mazes and bosses. Most of the characters will have a showdown with their rival character, a trope that still often appears in modern JRPGs. So we start with Romal, who confronts Guthro. Romal has figured out the truth. Guthro is Romal. Yep. He's from the alternate timeline before the past was changed. After going through his mopey phase at the pyramid, he somehow traveled back to the present with his two new companions and joined Bido's side before the first game. As a subtle hint, it is mentioned briefly in the first Burai that Romal was working on inventing a time machine prior to the events of the game, but never got it to work. I guess it's implied that the evil Romal eventually figured out time travel, but you really have to use your imagination to put this whole story together since not much explanation is given. Guthrow tells Romal that he can't kill him because then Romal will die too. 
Apparently that's how it works, according to this game's time travel rules. This is in contrast to, say, Back to the Future rules, where back and forth is possible, and of course, Time Rider rules, which are just plain silly. So anyway, Romal kills Guthrow and they both die. A lot of people say they actually really liked this scene and thought Romal was really brave, though they were all just as confused about the time travel aspect as you probably are. Next, Gonza and Mai Mai defeat Zoltoba, who yields and asks for Gonza to help him up. He takes this chance to kill Gonza in the most horrifying scene of the game. Damn, I think I'm scarred for life. Mai Mai then kills Zoltoba in the cutscene. Next is Alec and Kuk versus Haja. They're having a wizard's duel. After the battle, Haja reveals that he is one of the three wise men who guard the hell spell. It actually wasn't that Haja was disguised as the wise man in the earlier scene. Haja really is the wise man and is over 6,000 years old. He again tells Kuk that Alec killed his grandfather, and Alec admits that it's the truth. Kuk immediately forgives him though, saying that Alec must have had a good reason. Haja reiterates that if Kook doesn't kill Alec, then he can never learn the Hell Spell. Kook says he doesn't care, gets angry, and releases a full power attack spell directed at Haja. However, Alec steps in the way. Haha, my revenge is complete. Did you really think that killing Alec would allow you to learn the spell? What did you say? You mean I got myself killed for nothing? What? You're still alive? Ho 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 ho, don't you know that these guys saved your life 6,000 years ago? The battle between Sakyo and Barbara seems the most pointless of all, since now Sakyo has his divine powers fully restored and has 9,999 of both kinds of HP. After the battle, Sakyo agrees to take Barbara on as an apprentice. Next, Hayate and Lillian finally come face to face with Lillian's childhood fiance, Lee Shannon who is one of Bido's henchmen. It goes pretty much how you would expect. Greetings, Hayate. Haven't you heard about me from Lillian? Lillian, I haven't even met her yet. Do you know her? What do you mean? Lillian's right there behind you. Behind me? That's not Lillian. It's Lisa. Who the hell is Lisa? That girl behind you is Lillian. What do you mean? Okay, stop. I'll explain. Lee ends up fighting Hayate one-on-one. -on -one. After being defeated, he explains he was afraid that Hayate, being of divine lineage, would take Lillian to live in the heavens. Hayate says he has no intention to live among the gods, so Lee gives Hayate and Lillian his blessing. Finally, Hayate and Lillian face off against Bido. Let's watch this epic battle in its entirety. Ooh, two hits. That's actually a pretty strong boss for this game. After Bido is defeated, he plays the only card he has left. He holds in his hand an orb which needs to be broken to destroy the alternate dimension and send everyone home. However, he stands over a portal to subspace, from where there is no return. Bido dives in, but Hayate follows after him. Bido is like, What are you doing, you fool? Now you'll never get home. To which Hayate replies that if he doesn't break the orb, then no one will get home anyway. Which is a really good point. So of course he breaks it, and in a flash of light, everyone but Hayate is back home. After they all explain to the others everything that happened, the first to leave is Mai Mai when her companions from the street performance group come looking for her. Kuk goes with Haja, who's actually one of the old wise men, in order to learn the hell spell for real. Wait, are you sure you really want to do that? Hoo hoo, what a kook! It also mentions that he came to live in Alex's village after learning the spell. The last one to remain is Lillian. Hey, aren't you gonna wait and greet the great pumpkin, huh? I think you already know what happens. The game leaves us with the words that Lillian and Hayate's story is only beginning. Finally, there's supposed to be a credits scroll here, but it seems that on some PC-98 models, probably newer ones like mine, it just freezes up instead. This Twitter user had the same issue. I was able to see the credits, however, using an emulator. But anyway, that's how the story of Burai ends. Personally, while I definitely found the story engaging throughout and wanted to know what happens to the characters, the whole thing seems a bit weird and ultimately leads to an ending that feels anticlimactic and unsatisfying. On one hand, I applaud them for taking risks, but on the other, the deaths of the characters didn't really feel justified to me from a narrative standpoint. It was good to have closure, and I don't regret playing through this series at all, but it did leave me feeling a bit empty in the end. 
On the game system side, one huge oversight is that Hayate and Lillian have special abilities that are literally impossible to obtain. The books required to unlock these abilities are only sold in one of the towns in the past, but even if you buy them, Hayate and Lillian won't be able to equip them until you have them in your party near the very end of the game, and by that point it is impossible to return to an area with random battle encounters. Without random battles, these meters don't increase as you walk around, so they will never learn the abilities. Or will they? Like the first game, the way the user disc saves your character's stats is sort of separate from how it saves overall progress in the scenarios. I won't go into detail here, but if you understand how this works, it's possible to swap out multiple user discs and start the game over from the beginning while keeping all your stats and equipment from the end for a sort of new game plus that was never intended by the developers. So yes, driven by the allure of doing something that isn't supposed to be possible, I did indulge myself in an entire second loop of the game. So without further ado, I present Hayate and Lillian's Lost Abilities. Let's talk about the soundtrack. The music is a downgrade from the first game in almost every possible way. First off, while the first PC-88 game used the soundboard too, the PC-98 Burai games were released before similar soundboards became available for the PC-98. So this game uses only the old Minoral PC-980126 soundboard, which is the equivalent of the PC-88 soundboard 1. This alone isn't necessarily terrible, since of course there are plenty of games which have excellent music using this sound chip, but the arrangement here just isn't especially good. The FM usually sounds kind of thin and tinny. As for the composition, this time instead of the band Shouya, they got the keyboardist from the band Crystal King, who are best known for the opening of the anime Fist of the North Star. However, the Burai composer didn't write that song. He wrote the somewhat less well-known ending theme. His Burai soundtrack seems to emphasize quantity over quality. Though there are a huge number of tracks, most of them are on a short repeating loop, and many sound like filler. Though I think there are a few catchy tunes, overall the music is on the lower end of passable for me. It's no wonder that they decided not to release any soundtrack CDs this time. But of course, they did still bother porting the game to a couple of other PCs. If you're looking for something even more terrible than the PC-98 version, then look no further than the MSX2 port. On one hand, the graphics actually look pretty good for the MSX2, but the battle system is less user-friendly, with all the icons removed. The music also annoyingly cuts out, but the music isn't particularly good in this one anyway. And actually there's no music at all without the FM pack. This version was released by the software company Brother, but according to Wikipedia, River Hillsoft developed the game themselves. The other PC port was for the Fujitsu FM Towns. Here the scrolling seems a bit smoother, but other than that, it looks exactly the same as the PC-98 version. There aren't a lot of differences in gameplay, but I noticed that in the battles, the items begin toggled off instead of on, which overall I think I prefer. The music has been improved quite a bit. Not only does this version have some CD arranged tracks like the first FM Towns Burai, but the FM chiptunes also sound a bit better here than the PC-98 version, with lots of drum samples and stereo sound. Overall, if you're determined to play one of the original PC versions of the second Burai rather than the PC Engine remake, then I guess this is probably the least painful way to do it. And speaking of the remake, let's talk about it. Burai 2 is probably the only really good thing to ever come of the second Burai. It's best to think of it as a completely different game with the same story. It's quite a good looking PC Engine game, with fairly pleasant music too. A lot of it is completely original, though a few tunes from the PC-98 game are recognizable as well. Unlike the first PC Engine Burai, there is a ton of voice acting work, most of which is compressed as ADPCM samples. The game also uses ADPCM for almost all the sound effects, even in the menus, which may have sounded cool when the game was new, but nowadays I think some players may find them a bit irritating. 
The most recognizable thing carried over from the PC-98 game is the character art, though there are even quite a few new cutscenes where there was only text dialogue on the PC-98. And as much as I loved that weird battle system, it's probably for the best that they replaced it with a more orthodox one. There are no surprises here, it works like you would expect a turn-based JRPG battle system to work. The alternate battle types like fortune telling and street performances are gone. The dungeon layouts are mostly changed and your character walks much faster with a much lower battle encounter rate. I like the way the hospitals work in this game too. You pay a price to heal each character based on how much HP and MP they're missing. The menus are quite user friendly for 1992 and the equipment system has been changed to be more in line with the first Barai, which is good. Annoyances like the library book puzzle and the raft minigame are gone, and the pirate ship navigation part has been replaced with a simple menu to travel instantly to the missing ships. But while these annoying parts were cut, other parts that felt too short and rushed have been expanded upon extensively. Most notably, the segment that takes place 6,000 years in the past has a large map, serving as a worthy main overworld for the second half of the game. The lore of the world and the conflict between light and dark is greatly expanded upon. As was lightly touched on in the first game, light and dark aren't the same as good and evil. And if anything, the dark side are more often portrayed as the good guys by the end of the game. You also get all eight of the original Jewel Warriors in your party before the point of no return at the end, allowing you to level up and improve your characters all you want. Some players will be annoyed that you can't save your game during the last dungeon which was also the case in the MSX version, by the way. But I understand why they did this. They wanted to make sure that even after you finish the game, you can still go back to the main overworld in the past and continue to improve your party and buy equipment. Besides, while they did add enemy encounters to the final dungeon, the challenge is still a joke, and it's over pretty quickly. So if you get there, just try not to panic about the fact that you can't save. The ending is mostly the same, and I still didn't find the conclusion especially satisfying, but I suppose they wouldn't want to completely change it and then have to decide which version is canon either. They did change quite a few major plot details along the way to make it all make a bit more sense. It feels like this is probably closer to the game they wanted to make in the first place, and they finally got to do it on the PC Engine. So the too long didn't watch version of this video is, just play the PC Engine version. And if you feel like you need to play Barai 1 first, then if possible you might want to do what this guy did and play it on the Sega Mega CD, and then play Barai 2 on the PC Engine. Cause the PC Engine version of Barai 1 just isn't very good in my opinion. So those are my recommendations. In the meantime, I think I kinda missed that weird battle system. Time for a third playthrough on the PC-98. Nah, just kidding. Thanks for watching the debut episode of PC-98 Paradise. Now that I've started this series, I'm thinking about maybe reviewing some good PC-98 games in the near future. I also haven't quit PC-88 Paradise either, so you can expect more videos about the PC-88 and other platforms too. This has been Mr. Jakes at Basement Brothers. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe if you enjoyed this, and I'll see you again in the next video.